welcome back. Uh, first talk is, of this session is from uh, Piyali Chatterjee. So can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. So the title of uh, the talk is The Solar Spiritual Conundrum. And uh, you have 30 minutes, so maybe five minutes for uh, discussion and 25 minutes for your talk. Okay, so you can share your uh, screen, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, you should be able to see my uh, screen now. Yeah, yeah, we can see. Right, okay. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. I'll just take the mouse here and let me do a full screen. Okay, so uh, I thank uh, Nandita and the organizers for inviting me to this uh, session and all my audience to spare their Saturday afternoon. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, our recent work on the solar, on solving or throwing light on the solar spicule conundrum, which I'll explain by and by. So this is a, a work, this is basically a Indo-UK uh, collaboration and uh, a substantial part of the PhD thesis of my student Shahil Deh. So as we know that uh, spicules are uh, spic spicules are uh, you know seen in different wavelengths over the sun everywhere over the sun, and uh, they potentially supply mass and momentum to the solar wind, and also they might be contributing to the heating of the solar atmosphere by dissipation of fast wave modes that they are carrying. So that's the reason that uh, uh, the solar physicists uh, study uh, and observers study the solar spicules. Yeah, so this is the, the present uh, existing understanding is that the solar convection is the driver certainly but it is not enough to produce all kinds of uh, spicules. And typically uh, the understanding has been that the spicules have a bimodal uh, distribution, type one and type two, which Durgesh was also referring to in the last session. And they have different uh, dynamical characteristics and morphological characteristics like their height and speeds and also believed to be formed by different mechanisms. So the, the idea is that uh, these type one and type two spicules, they are different in height. Type two is believed to be more energetic and their mechanisms are also different. Hmm. And of, often uh, modelers invoke uh, exotic physics to be able to explain why type two spicules are more energetic over type one spicules. However, the uh, simulations that I'm going to uh, show you today, uh, we uh, have a different understanding of you know, what's going on. So uh, this is a, a simple solar atmospheric model that we start from. It's an MHD approximation, and we use the uh, radiative LTE, local thermodynamic equilibrium approximation. The initial stratification is based on the model S and we also have optically thin radiative cooling and anisotropic Spitzer kind of uh, heat conduction along magnetic field lines. We have an external vertical magnetic field imposed, but there is no flux emergence from the photosphere. So a model has a, a sub photosphere and there is a chromosphere transition region and corona. So here is uh, basically the, uh, it's a 2D model. So in horizontally, it could be uh, about 18 megameters. And in the vertical, it is about 44 megameters. Uh, a small part of it, about five megameter is the convection zone. And we also have at the top, what is known as a sponge layer, which absorbs all the waves, the incoming waves, so that we uh, have uh, outgoing, we always have the flow which is outgoing at the base of the sponge layer. So using this model, we um, have, so I'm just directly showing you a movie, an animation from our simulation. So on the top panel here, you see synthetic emission at 80,000, 
uh, Kelvin, which mimics the silicon four uh, line, which is observed by IRIS, the 140.3 nanometer line observed by IRIS. And at the bottom, we have forward modeled uh, this to, uh, to uh, uh, show the SDO AIA 17.1 uh, nanometer. UV emission. So you see here that you know the spicules are um, moving, um, are shooting upwards and falling back. And some of the spicules they have bright tips in both uh, the silicon for emission, mimicking silicon for emission, as well as in uh, SDO AIA 17.1 uh, nanometer line. So going further to a snapshot of this, you can see that this is, this is uh, an image from the iris observation. And then you have a simulation here. So the panels on the left are basically the, uh, the snapshot of the simulation. And on the right-hand side, we have the time distance plot along, uh, along a vertical uh, slit. Hmm. So basically to show the parabolic nature of these uh, of these spicules, the spicule tips follow the parabolic paths when you uh, plot them in the time distance maps, and we have a certain distribution of spicule heights starting from six megameter to about twenty five uh, megameters. And as I said, let me emphasize again that most longer spicules show bright tips due to enhanced emission. Hmm. And sometimes the base of those spicules, which show bright, bright tips, um, we see evidence of field line reconnection. So these, uh, these uh, models are fairly um, fine resolution. So we resolve 16 kilometers on the, uh, you know, the surface of the sun, in the atmosphere of the sun. So uh, looking ahead, so this is a high distribution of synthetic spicules. So again, in a snapshot, you see that uh, you know uh, there are long to short, as so there are these different heights here. And if I consider you know the shorter spectrum, the spicules in the shorter height spectrum and the ones in the longer height spectrum, I find that the shorter ones are usually above these downflow uh, lanes, the convective downflow lanes, where these uh, flux tubes form these bunches and the plasma is being squeezed out. So when you squeezed out like a garden hose pipe, you get spicules, but these are not the tallest, tallest ones. These are sometimes the shortest ones. Whereas on the, uh, on the top of a granule, you uh, often see, uh, we often see spicules which are taller, taller than 20 megameters of height. And uh, these are because the granules are providing some kind of mechanical kick, a stronger, and more brutal mechanical kicks to this uh, to this plasma. Ah, sorry. So let me just uh, show it. Uh, uh, indicate here that here we take these two different horizontal uh, slits. I mean, you can take any one of these horizontal slits, and then when we do a time distance plot of that, which is indicated here, you uh, you can see that uh, these uh, there are these uh, waves which are clearly traveling upwards, the compression fronts, so where the plasma is compressed. And uh, then, um, then you uh, see, uh, then here I also so show in this blue curve, this typical sound speed in the atmosphere and the red curve is the Alvin speed. So these uh, compression uh, fronts, they are propagating at you know, the slow MHD, closer to the slow MHD uh, speeds. And these red uh, contours here, they indicate the uh, compression fronts, which we, uh, we can consider as shock fronts in this MHD model. And um, so, okay, so you take those horizontal slits that I showed earlier, and then what you find is these transversal kink modes, uh, they, which are propagating through the spicules. So the spicules are swaying in a sense, and the uh, the amplitude of these uh, amplitude of these kink mode, not not the propagation feed, speed, but the amplitude is about three kilometers per second, and we suspect these spicules are also showing sausage modes, but it is very difficult to separate out the sausage mode because there is you know so much of uh, 
transverse motion that we see here. Now, next, what we do is uh, we insert tracer particles, which are massless and chargeless into this, into our simulation as an afterthought. And then we find, I try to find out how these tracer particles are behaving. So we stack these tracer particles in six layers. So beginning from the photosphere to up to uh, say five, uh, five megameter into the solar atmosphere, we stack them in different layers. And you can see these, the, the, each layer has a different color so that you know where that uh, tracer particle has actually come from. So if I run this movie here, um, you would notice that the yellow uh, yellow particles, the yellow colored particles are basically near the photosphere. And of course they are sampling the plasma, which is much more denser than the particles which are blue and orange and golden. Hmm. So uh, because the blue, orange and golden correspond to the chromospheric plasma, which is much lighter. So from this, we uh, think that uh, this chromospheric plasma is being pushed upwards by this photospheric driving. And they are being confined into spicule-like structures because of this magnetic field that uh, is present in the domain. So, and in, at, a, at no point do we see that any of the photospheric plasma actually goes all the way up into the atmosphere. It is always the chromospheric plasma, which being lighter is kicked up uh, higher, which is obvious because, you know, if the force is larger and the mass is less, it experiences a larger acceleration. So it is, um, it is just your normal uh, Newton's law. So now we take the same uh, tracer particles, but color them with uh, the vertical component of acceleration on the left panel here and the vertical component of velocity in the right panel. So uh, just to make the uh, visual thing clear, so the red and green shades corresponds to um, plasma, which is going up and experiencing a positive acceleration correspondingly. And the blue and yellow corresponds to the plasma, which is falling back and experiencing deceleration hmm, in, in either panels. So here you can see that uh, you see this green, uh, green, uh, very uh, concentrated front, which is moving upward. You also see evidence of fast MHD waves which are uh, propagating, but these green, uh, very concentrated fronts are propagating slower. And uh, these fronts also coincide with what is these black contours on the right side, which are, uh, which uh, demarcate the shock fronts, right? And these green uh, concentrated regions on the left actually correspond to strong positive vertical acceleration. So our positive acceleration, strong positive acceleration is, is correlated in space and time with the plasma, which is compressed strongly. So that is the region of strong shock as well. Hmm. And from this, you also see that if you concentrate on a single spicule, the plasma is not uh, traveling at the same speed all over the spicule. So uh, the top of this top of this uh, top of the spicule the plasma is still going up whereas at the bottom it has already started falling down so that is a fine structure of the spicule that we can discern from this high resolution uh, simulations by using uh, a very uh, a very uh, uh, well known technique of lagrangian tracking so now here what i do is i uh, we take these two different uh, spicules. One is a shorter one and one is a longer one. And we uh, have these tracers. So in both cases, now we uh, the color represents the vertical velocity. It's just the vertical velocity. There's no acceleration here. So on the left one, so this is the spicule which is formed um, uh, just uh, above a uh, uh, granular, uh, uh, granular boundary. So that is where the squeezing is occurring. So you can see this plasma becomes red and then green, which means it's, it's being squeezed. Whereas on the uh, right hand side, you see this is a granule. If you can see my mouse here, and on the top of a granule, the granule is going up and down, kicking this, uh, kicking this plasma up, which is green in color and it is shooting up. So there are these two different mechanisms on uh, way apart in this 
spectrum of the height distribution, one which is causing spicules which are shorter, shorter kicks, gentler kicks, and one which may give more brutal kicks, right? So this also reveals uh, the fine structure inside these synthetic spicules. So now I just uh, show it more pictorically in form of a, a phase plot. So here on the um, x-axis, you have the vertical acceleration and on the y-axis, you have the vertical velocity. So if the kick were gentle, you would see a triangular kind of a shape here uh, where um, the, you know, this is much smaller. It corresponds to a gentle kick. And it also corresponds to, it's the same kick which is taking place just above that uh, uh, inter, of that uh, granular downflow lane. Hmm. Whereas on the right hand side, the kick is more brutal and it is taking place right above the granule. So this spicule is likely to be longer than the, uh, than the spicule which has received a gentler kick. Hmm. So now this amplitude of this kick will also have a distribution and depending on this distribution, you will get the height of your spicule. That is what we uh, think is happening here. And uh, here also, again, I'm showing a small uh, snapshot from the uh, previous movie that you have. And here I try to explain what each part of the, uh, each part of the space space means. So just look at this right panel here and you see this triangular shape. So here, uh, this part here where uh, I show it with a black arrow corresponds to particles which are entering that acceleration front. It is that same thin strong acceleration front indicated in green that you saw in the earlier movie. Whereas this, uh, this part of the triangle here, the top part, this is these are the particles which are exiting the acceleration front. And here, the vertical, the particles which are falling back along this vertical line are particles which are experiencing free fall. So that is basically what is happening. And how big this triangle is, since this is the acceleration, this axis, how big this triangle is tells you how strong the kick was, the kick that was, the, that was received by the plasma, which will later form the spicule. So this one corresponds to the granular, uh, the top of the granule where the kicks were stronger and the granules were basically uh, moving, uh, you know, were, um, were breathing up and down. And whereas on the left-hand side, you have the squeezing, uh, the, in the downflow lane squeezing. So here you see the triangle is much smaller, but it is the same mechanism particles uh, entering the front on uh, on the lower side, exiting the front on the top top side, and the vertical part is the particles under the free fall. Now here, this is basically the total vertical acceleration, the phase space of the total vertical acceleration. However, if I only look at the vertical acceleration due to the Lorentz force, what I get is the Lorentz force does play a role, but it is not the dominant one, right? So even though we observe reconnection happening in this region, uh, the reconnection is probably not playing such a big role. All it is helping is it is helping the plasma to uh, you know, leave the confines of the closed field line and shoot up to form spicules. But it is not uh, playing a very major role in the total, in the total acceleration that uh, can be obtained. The total acceleration is still being controlled by the uh, by the uh, by how strong the shock is at that point so now these were about some uh, results about the uh, 2d simulations we are now also performing 3d runs where um, where you can see that uh, uh, you know we have these uh, spicules again also forming by the same uh, same mechanism solar like convection and you also see transversal swaying, as well as you will notice in this movie, uh, if I can let uh, this, if I have time uh, to let this run a few times, you will see you will see twisting of strands of these strands around each other. Now, with further analysis, we believe that this spicules may even be a line of sight effect. Hmm. They may not be actually spike-like spicules, but they are probably uh, something like. Uh, the gathering of a curtain. So, you know, uh, the more the curtains are gathered in one place, denser the plasma is and more it is emitting. 
that is what is giving this illusion uh, but we are still uh, working on it so these uh, results are not uh, published yet and then we also use um, what is known as uh, automatic soil detection algorithm or asda uh, which is documented in this paper here um, at the bottom where uh, so in this in this movie in this animation you see this yellow uh, volume rendering which corresponds to the spicule uh, spicules emitting in um, i i think again silicon the silicon 80000 kelvin emission and uh, around that you have these tall uh, cylindrical swirls so often we observe that when a spicule is actually in, in its uh, dying throes there are these swirls which come from nowhere and surround these spicules before they fall back down so these are uh, some of these quick results but if you want more uh, more information i would uh, invite you to look at this poster by uh, shohel on spinning spicules and i think he'll be available on slack and uh, we have used the pencil coat for uh, these uh, solar atmosphere simulations and uh, my uh, also my student shomridhi might be he has he has been doing some 3d mhd uh, cme simulations using this same coat so i invite uh, all of you to please have a look at the posters as well and uh, let me uh, summarize uh, my talk here. So uh, we basically show that we have been able to assemble a forest of spicules and the solar convection on its own can generate strong acceleration fronts, which are needed to energize uh, forest objects. So the solar convection has different mechanisms like P mode, squeezing, granular, collapse, so on and so forth. And by itself, it can give rise to a distribution of heights of spicules from six megameter to 25 megameters. And we believe that we have matched the observations with much higher fidelity than earlier works. Um, and one uh, another important thing that I would note here is using the technique uh, a very old technique of Lagrangian tracking, we have found out that lighter chromospheric plasma is actually kicked upward by this photospheric global oscillations or what we know, what we call the P modes. The P modes are again generated by the solar convection, of course. So, uh, so these uh, P modes are basically kicking this lighter chromospheric plasma up, upwards along magnetic field lines. And then we get this forest-like appearance of uh, spicules and of course here they can be aided by magnetic reconnection but what we find in our simulation so far is magnetic reconnection may not be playing a very dominant role so we summarize some more findings here so the spicules that we obtain in our model they do match the uh, observed spicules quantitatively they have a lifetime of um, seven to 10 minutes. Vertical velocities that we get are of the order of 20 to 80 kilometers per second and sometimes even higher. And the lengths of these uh, spicules uh, range from six to 25 megameters. And we also predict some fine structure inside the spicules, which we believe can be observed by um, uh, uh, you know, uh, either um, the upcoming uh, solar telescopes like DKIS and probably NLST. And um, here, without, uh, without uh, actually demonstrating this, I would refer you to our uh, paper, which I have not presented here. Uh, the first author is also Shohel Day. And here uh, in this paper, we basically uh, propose the Reinhardt's Gibbot recipe for the spicule forest, which is basically that you need four main ingredients to assemble a forest of jets. Suppose you have a fluid medium and you have gravity, you have quasi-periodic kicks, and you have an anisotropic medium, a medium which has directionality, for example, by magnetic field. Then these four, uh, four uh, components are sufficient to generate a forest of spicules. You may have other kinds of spicules by different mechanisms, uh, but uh, they are different kinds of spicules. For a spicule forest, these are the minimum uh, conditions that you would need. 
So this is something I have not showed, shown or demonstrated in this talk, but I would still emphasize this as, emphasize this as one of our findings. So yeah, that's the end of uh, my uh, summary slide. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for uh, completing in time. So we have uh, time for some questions. So offline can, yeah, please go ahead. So there are some questions uh, offline. Hi, Pierre Panipata here, very nice talk. Thank uh, you, Vanu. Yeah, so my question may be very simple. Uh, what I don't understand, you did the simulation in the MHD debate. I believe ideal MHD. You don't. Uh, we have resistivity. We have resistivity. It is not ideal MHT. Is kind of numerical viscosity resistivity or? No, no. We have no explicit. Okay. Uh, then actually, my actual question was: system is necessarily big turbulent. I believe here, right? So in your resistivity, it is uh, just coming from the conductivity, or also you add turbulent viscosity because the leg scale and other issue. I believe, unless I miss something, solar uh, upper atmosphere also should be turbulent. So basically my question is how do you take care of that? Because that, uh, you know, viscosity origin still turbulence, not very well understood in my knowledge. So can you enlighten? And you are saying yeah. uh, whatever. Uh, yeah, I'll try. I'll, actually, uh, just yeah, I'll try was, my I noticed, of course, you mentioned at the end that, uh, that uh, your, I mean, basically, new gas curve V term might not be very important, as you said at the end, that uh, the connection is not very important. Is it uh, kind of answer to my question? Ah, okay. So, uh, what, what I mean when I say reconnection is not uh, important, uh, um, uh, of, of course, we have in MHT whatever reconnection you observe, and that is because of the resistivity that we have in the model, right? So we are not uh, we are not uh, actually uh, resolving the reconnection uh, microscopically hmm, that we cannot do in MHT. But in the for example in the velocity equation we have an explicit viscosity term, hmm. and so in the uh, in the induction equation we have a resistivity term. In the energy equation we have this thermal conduction along field lines modeled. So we have all these explicit uh, terms and uh, the, the pencil code is basically a higher order uh, finite difference scheme, a sixth order finite difference scheme. So it allows us to, um, allows us to, uh, allows us to work at a higher Reynolds number, right? So you are right, our simulation is turbulent, otherwise I, we won't get convection, right? Our convection is producing this five minute uh, you know, uh, dominant uh, solar mode. So, and we also see uh, these uh, turbulence in the granules in 3D and all that. So there is turbulence, not just in the photosphere, but also in the solar atmosphere. So, because if you remember, I showed you a movie uh, where uh, this movie here, where, uh, you know, you had these, uh, had these spicules, but you also have these swirls, which are actually really, really dynamic. So these are really unsteady and dynamic, which is probably a, um, indicates that we have a lot of turbulence. But okay, of course, I mean, we are not as, as high Reynolds number as you would expect in the sun, but uh, we are probably able to work at reasonably high uh, Reynolds numbers. Okay, so another question uh, online by Ramit. Uh, so Ramit, can you unmute and uh, ask your question directly? Yeah. Uh... Hi, Piyali. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I would, I wanted to ask the same question, actually, that uh, what is your fluids and uh, magnetic Reynolds number for these sim simulations? Okay. Um, frankly, I have not calculated the total uh, Reynolds number. We calculate what is known as the grids Reynolds number. Okay. Right. So the grids Reynolds, grid Reynolds number is basically you take the length scale of that grid size. Okay. So that... Um, if I'm not wrong, is of the order of 100 or 200. 
but that is the grids Reynolds, grid Reynolds number. So it is not the total Reynolds number. In okay, the I understand. Yeah, so how much turbulence would you expect with a 100, 200 uh, grid Reynolds number? Any idea, just a rough idea? Uh, so we have to do a spectrum of that. So yeah. that we have not done. So uh, basically because... it needs uh, probably a slightly longer time series. But what okay. we uh, what we basically looked at if if uh, this model has solar like properties or not. All right. So does that, do we get those time scales of P modes that is observed? So what are the velocity amplitudes that are observed on the okay. sun? And what are we getting in the model? So we basically match those uh, those velocity okay. amplitudes and time scales. To uh, you know, because the, these in three D or even in two D, uh, we have up to say you know max uh, say thirty minutes of uh, solar time. So yeah, uh, no, so, uh, yeah. yeah, So it's not very very long, uh, but we we think that we are matching uh, some of the properties that you observe in the actual solar convection. Okay, okay. I'm not thank sure you. if that answers the question. But no, 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 that was my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, another question is from uh, P. Rajaguru. So, can you unmute and ask, please? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was, uh, uh, yeah, I was wondering, and uh, you partly answered this, I think, for Ramit. I was wondering how, what is the typical amplitude of beam mode oscillation you have in your simulations? I mean, is it realistic? Uh, does it match with what we have for real sun? Yeah, yeah. So, so for example, um, the uh, typical amplitudes that we have is like one, one to one point, uh, one to two uh, kilometers per second at you know tau equal to uh, tau equal to point six or something like that. Or oh, so that is too high, right? Uh, so the P mode amplitudes on the sun are the very small amplitude oscillation. They are at the most few tens of meters per second. Yeah, but uh, Rajguru, we are resolving 16 kilometers here. So if I average, um, well, I don't know. I just look at basically, you know, uh, grid wise. So if I average over the observed, uh, you know, uh, the, um, but for, I example, don't think, uh, so, for example, from MDI or even from uh, HMI, so there the spatial resolution is uh, less. So you are essentially averaging over a larger uh, area than we have in our simulation. So that also is something that I think should be. Yeah, but uh, anyway, I think uh, the P mode oscillation amplitude doesn't depend so much on the resolution. But anyway, I think these are very, very high uh, wave number oscillation maybe, but uh, the typical P modes, which are resonant oscillations, which are... Uh, ah, so that yeah. needs to be averaged over whatever is observed in the HMI and then uh, found, found out. Uh, all right, okay, we, will, we can talk about it. Okay, there is uh, one question uh, from uh, audience, so please. Hmm? Hi, Priyadi ma'am, I'm Kamlesh. Uh, yeah, hi, Kamlesh. Thanks for such a nice presentation on speakers. Uh, my question is at what height the reconnection is taking place uh, in the ah, okay. reconnection you are claiming uh, uh -huh. in your simulation? So the reconnection is basically taking place around, you know, one, uh, around one to two megameter maybe. So in this movie, if I run this movie, this reconnection region actually moves a little bit. So, you know, I would think... Uh, if you're able to follow, so, you know, one. Maybe yeah, I can see that. Uh, so actually my next question, I saw that and uh, I noted also, but uh, I just to confirm. Mm -hmm. So then my question is how the, pro I mean, what is the degree of frozen and at that height in the solar atmosphere? Because the density and flow is very high there. So does uh, frozen and condition is really valid at that part of the solar atmosphere or uh, like uh, not? Because it's like below 10 megameter. It's basically frozen in condition is well defined in corona. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, yeah. So we have the uh, so we we have an ex explicit resistivity. So it is not it need not to be frozen in. So, but it not uh, be for reconnection. How two field lines will come close to each other to reconnect without frozen in condition? This see this this kind of a reconnection. It is not the reconnection. Uh, 
So this is numerical, it is, it is happening in a model. So this is an MHD reconnection, right? So it is different from uh, what you have. Uh, so th there is no uh, singularity here, right? In the sense you're, I think what you, uh, in that sense, because the, the resistivity is not, not um, zero. Right, so when I say reconnection, this is happening because I have explicit or implicit or numerical uh, resistivity in the image. Okay, uh, if you have more questions, maybe continue on chat. Yeah, so thanks, it will be better. Hmm? So uh, thank you, Yali Chatterjee. Thank you. And that is thanks to the speaker. Thank you. And the next speaker is Arpit Srivastava. Coronal rain, effects of transverse oscillations of coronal loops and thermal evolution. You think Hello. Achha, <laughs> okay. 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 So, uh, uh, coronal rains are cool, cool plasma condensations, which are formed at coronal heights falling towards, uh, uh, magnetic field lines. And, uh, they are mostly associated with, uh, active coronal, active region loops, which are subjected to strong foot point heating. So, <clears throat> Uh, actually, uh, after a uh, strong foot point heating, there is plasma pile up at the loop top and which uh, cools down to time scales of minute uh, due to radiative losses, and uh, which is known as catastrophic cooling. After uh, uh, we can see in the uh, plot below that uh, uh, in 304 ring storm, which is a cooler channel in AIA, uh, there is increase in emission after some time. So, uh, these uh, uh, coronal rains are uh, uh, generally appears at temperature between 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5 Kelvin and they have a lower acceleration than gravitational free fall. Uh, so uh, these are some uh, particular properties of uh, coronal rain. Uh, the main aim of, of uh, my work is associated with transverse oscillation. And uh, uh, these transverse oscillation have been observed in, uh, pre in previously in uh, many, uh, many publications and um, uh, in research. So these are all, these coronal rain uh, stands uh, have been seen oscillating uh, in SGI Iris uh, movies and uh, analysis uh, of uh, SOT uh, you know, the, uh, movies. So you can see in this video, particular video, the, the coronal is falling towards, uh, uh, towards the surface along magnetic field lines. So 
uh, uh, the uh, the periods of these uh, oscillation lie between 10 uh, sec 100 seconds to 200 seconds and uh, they have amplitude of order of 500 kilometer or less uh, for which at all 2017 and pose a mechanical model uh, uh, that uh, coronal rain may excite uh, the transfer oscillation uh, and uh, uh, they uh, after that uh, Varvich and Kohota in 2017 they uh, they have uh, analyzed a particular a particular loop in iris images and they have taken taken two uh, two artificial slits uh, uh, parallel to the loop x6 and perpendicular to the uh, loop top they found that uh, there is some simultaneity between uh, coronal loop oscillations and uh, and uh, appearance of the coronal rays. And they also seen uh, uh, the plasma flow along this uh, particular uh, 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 slit. And, and they, after that, they followed the uh, position of individual rain blobs as a distance related to approximate loop top as a function of time. And uh, uh, they, they concluded that uh, they found that uh, uh, these falling rain blobs has similar periodicity as the oscillation period of the uh, uh, of the uh, oscill as the oscillation period so they concluded that uh, this may be the evidence that uh, uh, coronal rain may excite transverse oscillations but the problem in in the uh, conclusion that they have not analyzed any oscillation in am images before and after coronal rain so uh, our main aim, aim of the work is to analyze ai images for a particular event before and after coronal rain and to see whether we are, we are able to find any oscillation uh, uh, so so that we conclude uh, uh, conclude about the notion made by Varvich uh, uh, and Kohutawa 2017 so uh, for that we have take, uh, we have used the observation of aia uh, and uh, this particular green uh, box you, you can see here has been also been observed in iris sgi 2796 2796 angstrom and 1400 angstrom uh, uh, fast bands so these are the two uh, uh, particular properties of the instruments so uh, iris is a uh, iris is a uh, has a FOV, uh, field of view whereas aia has a aia is a full disk imager it has uh, pixel size more than uh, iris uh, we have uh, used two main channels of AIA, 304 angstrom and 171 angstrom, whereas uh, the 1400 angstrom and 2796 angstrom channel have been used for iris uh, uh, for our analysis. And we can see that uh, uh, for our analysis, uh, uh, for, uh, we have chosen uh, uh, enough uh, coverage of uh, temperature range to, uh, to find the oscillation and capture it and before and after coronal also. So, <sighs> Before going uh, going into the analysis, we have done some uh, initial processing. So for that, we have used we have reduced the level one data of uh, uh, AIA uh, to level one point five, and we have directly used the iris level two data. Uh, in step two, we have unsub masked the AIA one seventy one angstrom images, which you can say in this particular video. So unsub masking uh, actually enhances the edges of the uh, structures and. Uh, uh, using uh, using uh, this technique, we are able to see the uh, uh, fine coronal loop strands. So uh, after that, uh, we also have done in step three radial gradient gradient filtering of iris and AIA uh, three zero four angstrom images, which you can say uh, in in this particular image. So uh, this radial gradient filtering is applied whenever we need uh, we need uh, to enhance the offlink features. So uh, the list, last step uh, was to uh, co-align AIA and iris images for that uh, because we have to uh, uh, we need a co uh, we, we need co speciality, speciality uh, of uh, uh, analysis because uh, we are going to use artificial shields so co-aligning is very important uh, process for that so for that we have uh, plotted the contours uh, contours on um, um, contours of some labels uh, in SGI 2796 and SGI 1400 images. And uh, for the same time, we have overplotted this contour to AA 304 angstrom. And if we find any shift, uh, any shift in the features or any shift in the uh, in the box we have chosen, we have manually shifted the uh, AA images for that. So these this are the co learning processes we have done. Uh, so we have taken uh, uh, nine different artificial suits uh, at two two different loops uh, in the in, in this particular event and 
several transverse oscillation are seen in these uh, in these slits uh, uh, in these slits and uh, uh, so uh, as i have mentioned earlier that uh, motion magnitude uh, as i have mentioned earlier that no oscillation was found in kohutawa and very 2017 paper so for that uh, we have used a technique which is called motion magnification technique so it was uh, previously established that uh, sto ai uv images support low amplitude transverse periodic oscillations or motions uh, which and which has amplitude uh, less than a pixel size so we have used this motion uh, motion magni magnification technique which is used uh, phase boost uh, phase based um, magnification so uh, it is a uh, it it actually decomposes the images into complex 2d wavelets and uh, after that it magnifies the phase for any transverse motion so uh, in this uh, particular image we can see for in in the original data we can we are not able to see any oscillation by our eye okay so here uh, after magnification of 3 and 9 we are able to see so many oscillation uh, so uh, this technique was very useful for our work so we have used magnification factor of 7 for our work and after that uh, we take here i am showing the uh, individual uh, instances where we find uh, coronal rain in optically thick channel and uh, before and uh, after oscillation in, in that particular loop also so here the here the image shows the, uh, the oscillation in iris 2 and 7 9 against from uh, image and we have fitted uh, this uh, uh, oscillation using sinusoidal fit fitting Uh, uh an algorithm we we have used was described in morton et al 2012 12 so we also uh, fitted the oscillation before coronal rain in aia 171 images so uh, this blue line particular blue line these two oscillation are before coronal rain and uh, uh, we compared the, uh, the properties uh, before and after coronal rain uh, in 2796 and aia 304 and aia 171 we found that uh, for slit 11 uh there is a, there is not much increase or variation in period but uh, there is increase in amplitude during coronal rain so uh we have analyzed one uh, other slit uh, uh, which which i present here so uh, here uh, uh, this particular Im image is ai 304 ms ton and we have uh, fitted the uh, amplitude uh, the oscillation Uh, which is during coronal rain, and this particular oscillation we find in 171 ms ton after coronal rain. So the properties are here, and we found that there is increase in this period as well as in amplitude uh, uh, after coronal rain. So uh, so for building the statistics, we uh, we uh, plotted the amplitude of oscillation detected in uh, every uh, all the slits uh, we have plot, uh, we have uh, I have shown earlier. so we found that uh, before and after coronal rain in uh, aia 171 ms storm the amplitude maximum amplitude of oscillation are uh, 200 around 200 km but uh, mm, in optically thick channel during coronal rain uh, we found that there are uh, multiple oscillations which has uh, amplitudes greater than 200 km so uh, uh, we have done the similar uh, analysis for period and uh, we found that uh, the maximum period in observed in uh, for oscillation in 171 ms storm is around 3 minute whereas there are many oscillations in iris uh, 1400 and uh, uh, other optically thick channel which have oscillation greater than oscillation period greater than 3 3 minutes so uh, here we can see that um, there um, there is increase uh, increase in period and uh, uh, amplitude before uh, uh, during coronal rain so after that uh, i want to conclude my talk by saying that uh, we have used motion magnification technique which allows us to detect the small amplitude oscillation before and after coronal rain so uh, we also found evidence of oscillation before and after coronal rain approximately at same locations uh, and uh, the uh, conjecture made uh, made by kohutawa and were which 2017 that coronal rain is exciting the transverse oscillation uh, will uh, it may not be true Uh, it is also possible that uh, oscillation not present uh, uh, already and uh, coronal rain alters the properties of oscillations so uh, we found the range of oscillation in a 171 ms storm in this to be 50 to 200 km whereas in optical thick channel we found that it has uh, amplitude of oscillation around 100 to 400 km range and uh, uh, also for uh, period we found the same kind of uh, relation 
So uh, there, include, uh, there is increase in amplitude of oscillation during coronal rain and increase in period of oscillation uh, for, few, in, for few instances. Uh, uh, so after that, uh, I want to uh, say some, something about or my future work. Uh, I will uh, try to first explore the cause, on, cause of increase in amplitude and period during coronal rain. We have worked uh, a few steps uh, in that direction, uh, but still uh, the work is going on. And uh, uh, I will also use the DM weighted temperature to explore the thermal evolution of loops uh, with coronal rain and try to link the appearance, uh, appearance of oscillation in XT map. Uh, we can also estimate the density of coronal rain using uh, uh, silicon four and uh, four line in uh, line ratios in iris, and uh, we we can infer the magnetic field. So these are some uh, future work we can do in this project. And uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, I'm open to the question. Okay, thank you. So there is, uh, okay, you can ask. Yeah. Uh, hi, Alpin. Thank yeah. you for this nice talk. I have a few questions. Mm -hmm. One is, um, what about error bars? You had some amplitude measurements and period. Yeah, measurements. yeah, I am not quoted here, but uh, they were, uh, I should, uh, because there was uh, not so, so much, uh, uh, so much uh, difference. Uh, I mean, there are not, not, not significance enough, like 0 0.02. So they are not coming in the scale. So that's why I'm not plotted there. But I can be, uh, I can plot that in, in the plot. Okay. I just wanted to know if there were error bars. Yeah, yeah, there, there were error bars. And yeah. the other question was, did you use this interesting method to get out the oscillation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. do you know that um, these methods are not introducing oscillations on their own? Like, how do you check? The yeah, there, is, there are some limitations uh, about this motion magnetism technique. So if, the, if we are finding the oscillation period, Period, less than five six frames we are using uh, like uh, less than five six frames we are finding that may be uh, uh, that may be noise so we have to check for that manually also so we can use the video analysis for that uh, no we have to take caution for that actually okay is there any question yeah so i have one yeah so carrying forward his question mm -hmm. uh, i have two small questions on the same maybe one is sufficient mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other question you can ask in the tea time. So, just one question. Yeah, yeah. So, does your uh, method depend on the mesal wavelet you select? Because, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a discrete cosine wavelet transform, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, do you so, have the wavelets? Or no, no, no. This, is, this was the method developed by, uh, 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 let me see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, we don't have that. Uh, we can change, but I have not changed uh, changed anything in that. We have I have used at, uh, as it is. So I cannot comment on that, but uh, I can see if, if there is something or that, and I can send you about it. Okay. So any other from the speaker? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Uh, this is Ramit. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, this is a very naive question. So I'm no expert on coronal rain, mm -hmm. but whenever I see a movie of coronal rain, mm -hmm. I see typically field line features, mm -hmm. kind of can perceive field line features, uh, which are like three dimensional magnetic null. So is there any any influence of magnetic reconnection on the coronal rains? What is your take on it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, in this particular event, we do not find any uh, that type of uh, thing in this particular event. But uh, for other event, like uh, I was also uh, I was also watching our other events. So there was an event where uh, uh, where there was a null point and the magnetic reconnection and coronal rain was simultaneously happening at that uh, uh, at that uh, at at that time. So there may be possibility for that also. I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Chair, may I ask one? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, so my question is about the uh, physical origin of those oscillations which you see before the coronal line actually occurs. So uh, what about the phase relationship of these waves uh, you see across different channels? Uh, different channels? Uh, yeah, so different uh, channels. Have, uh, cooler to hotter channels. Do you see phase being altered? As you move from no no uh, actually actually uh, we have not seen a phase being altered actually ah okay yeah that's interesting okay if uh, there is no question so thanks to speaker and uh,
next speaker is uh, divya kirti misra uh, study of chromospheric differential rotation of sun using calcium 2k data google bol share share me Hello everyone. Uh, I am Divya Kirti Mishra. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank organizers, organizers uh, to give me opportunity to present my work. Uh, I am uh, uh, today. I am going to tell about the study of uh, chromospheric differential rotation of the sun using uh, calcium K data. Uh, first, uh, I will give brief introduction about the what is differential rotation. Uh, as all we know that uh, sun doesn't rotate as a rigid body. it rotates differentially the equator rotates uh, faster uh, than the pole uh, as you uh, can see in the left cartoon image uh, that when you are going to from equator to pole uh, the uh, rotation rate uh, is decreasing so uh, based on the observation the empirical relation for differential rate uh, is uh, 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 this omega equals to a plus b sin square theta plus c sin to the power 4 theta Where omega is the angular rotation rate, a is the uh, 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 equatorial rotation rate, b and c are the uh, differential rate, and theta is the heliographic latitude. So uh, we know that the uh, to understand the solar dynamo model, uh, the solar differential rotation rate is very much important, and uh, there were lots of study uh, have, uh, happened in the uh, on this solar differential rotation rate in the photospheric layer. but uh, in chromosphere which is the upper layer of the photospheric layer uh, in that uh, the differential rotation rate is not that much well understood so our aim is uh, uh, to understand the uh, latitudinal ro uh, differential rotation rate uh, in the chromospheric layer also to understand the coupling between the the, uh, uh, the different layers of the sun um uh, here in specifically uh, i am uh, uh, telling about the photosphere between the photosphere and the chromospheric layer so uh, uh, for my work uh, the data i uh, i used was taken from kodai canal solar observatory uh, this uh, right and uh, right side image you are seeing is the uh, calcium k full disk image uh, from the kodai canal solar observatory uh the calcium k we know that the is uh, it has a wavelength uh, 399 uh, 33.67 angstrom and uh, this uh, data is about uh, 100 years uh, starting from 1907 to 2007 and it contains the information uh, uh, more than uh, uh, nine solar cycles uh this data in the past uh, in the past this data was digitized and calibrated uh, by uh, priya let all uh, uh, you can refer this paper and uh, for the uh, also this uh, that uh, de, this full disk calcium k data was calibrated by chatrijos et al uh, so here uh, in this uh, for my work i am using uh, this uh, recently calibrated full disk calcium k data also the corrected time stamp data so uh, next come to method methodology part Uh, so here you can see this uh, first uh, two images this first image is the uh, day one image and this this is uh, the second is uh, the next image and this is in heliocentric attrition coordinates and this y is, is y coordinate and x uh, is uh, x coordinate in pixel uh so uh, here uh, we converted uh, this uh, heliocentric uh, cartesian images uh, into heliographic coordinate images uh, for uh, uh, day one uh, as well as the next images also 
So this x axis is the in longitude in degree and this y is the latitude in degree. So what is the uh, purpose behind this conversion? Uh, because we know that when you are, uh, uh, the features are moving over the day, it will move uh, in a curved path. So to uh, know how much shift is happening uh, over the day, it's difficult for the, for the curved path. So if you convert into a straight line path, so uh, the, uh, the shifting to find out the, how much shifting is happening over the day is much more convenient. So after this heliographic conversion, uh, we have taken the range in latitude from minus 55 to plus 55 degree. Uh, we did not go further at higher latitude because at higher latitude, uh, the uh, features are much more stretched. Also, uh, we have taken the latitudinal beams of five degree in this uh, minus uh, 55 to plus 55 de uh, degree latitudinal range. And also in uh, the longitudinal range is uh, taken from uh, minus 55 to plus 55 degree. So uh, uh, here you can see uh, this uh, particular uh, uh, window of uh, five degree latitudinal wind uh, from 30 to 35 degree. And uh, same for the uh, image day two also. Uh, so here, uh, in this way, we have selected this uh, different latitudinal winning and uh, we uh, correlated this uh, uh, two consecutive day images. And uh, uh, by using image correlation technique uh, at the maximum correlation coefficient, uh, it gives uh, the longitudinal, how much longitudinal shift is happening uh, at the uh, maximum correlation. So we have taken that uh, particular uh, longitudinal shift value and uh, uh, then uh, we found the uh, equatorial rotation rate omega uh, that is uh, equals to del phi by del t. Uh, uh, del phi is uh, longitudinal shift that we got in the pre previous uh, I have shown. And uh, this del t is the time interval between uh, these two uh, images. And omega is the angular rotation rate. Uh, here you can see this del t equals to t2 minus t1 and t2 is the uh, time for image day 2 and t1 is the time for image day 1. Uh, also, we have uh, done a side, uh, sidereal correction and we repeated this uh, uh, method for every latitudinal beam and uh, for uh, all over the images of the data. So here, uh, yeah, here we got uh, the uh, uh, got the result of uh, angular rotation rate uh, uh, using the uh, calcium K codecanal uh, uh, data. Uh, here you can see this red curve, and uh, here we found uh, this blue curve is the uh, uh, photospheric rotation rate uh, uh, got uh, uh, by in Jartal paper using uh, codecanal white light data. So here you can see that we found the chromosphere uh, uh, rotation rate is uh, uh, faster than photosphere. Uh, next, uh, we in this uh, curve, this black curve is uh, the result got uh, uh, by using uh, Mount Wilson calcium K data found in Bartel et al. paper. So in that uh, paper, they got the, uh, that the chromosphere rotation uh, is uh, slower than photosphere. But still, we are not uh, uh, confident about this uh, result. Uh, we cannot, in this situation, we cannot say that uh, uh, that is, uh, is this result is correct or not. Uh, and chromospheric rotation is uh, rotating faster than photosphere. Uh, um, uh, in the uh, Bartel et al. result, it should uh, uh, match with the this uh, black curve. Uh, it should not go uh, higher than this because uh, they have used the, the same cal means, uh, different observatory, but same calcium K line data. Uh, uh, but there are some uh, evidences uh, like in Lee et al. 2020 paper. Uh, they uh, also found that uh, the chromosphere is rotating uh, faster than photosphere using helium-1 absorption line. But still, uh, we cannot say this is uh, result is correct or not. Uh, to validate our result, we also uh, this applied the same method on the AIA 1600 angstrom data, which is uh, an upper uh, chromospheric uh, layer. So we, we followed the same uh, method uh, as previous, and uh, uh, we got uh, the also uh, 
uh, we, this green is uh, the result uh, uh, got by using the AI 1600 angstrom data. And also in this also, we found that uh, this curve is uh, going upper than the photosphere. So this is uh, the comparison uh, between the different uh, 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 di different uh, data. This is the codagonal uh, white light data found in Jhartal paper, and uh, this is uh, in Mount Wilson calcium K uh, uh, data result, and this is the AI sixteen hundred uh, result, and uh, this uh, I got uh, using codagonal uh, calcium K data. To uh, summarize my work, uh, uh, we have used the uh, century long uh, Code Canal Solar Observatory uh, Calcium K full disk images for our analysis, which is what was, that was from 1907 to 2007. And uh, we also applied the image correlation technique to find the differential rotation rate at chromosphere clear. Uh, uh, we uh, in that uh, result we found that the chromosphere is rotating faster than photosphere from our result, but uh, uh, we can, cannot uh, say confidently about this that this is correct or not. So we'll further verify this result by using the uh, different methods, and also after verifying, we'll go further. Uh, 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 we'll study the uh, rotation uh, differential rotation rate with uh, different uh, solar cycles as well. Uh, so um, thank you all. Okay, thank you. So there are some questions. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, this curve actually, the red curve uh, is not not for. Uh, I have not uh, taken whole hundred data, hundred years data. Here it is for fifty years, nineteen ten to nineteen fifty nine. Uh, because uh, uh, still we are not confident about this. We got this result above than photosphere. So after verifying this, we'll uh, go for a whole hundred years. Uh, uh, this. Yeah, the longitudinal shift. The uh, we have shifted this day one image uh, for in particular range, and uh, in the maximum correlation coefficient, we got uh, how much these uh, two uh, images are correlated, and that uh, longitudinal shift we uh, have taken. What's the value? Uh, it's uh, actually at uh, vary at 0 0.6, 0 0.8 like that. Uh, but in different latitude also it is lower. I mean, at high latitude, it's not that much. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because... Uh, we have to find the theory for that. Yeah. 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 Actually, in in Bartolo paper that we are comparing, the they have used the calcium K data. So they the that's the same calcium K data, but in Mount Wilson the band pass is zero point three angstrom, and in Kodi Canal Solar Observatory uh, they have uh, the band pass is zero point five angstrom. So there should not be much variation uh, of the height of the uh, we are looking at. So that but uh, they. Uh, uh, have used the different uh, method also, and we have used different methods. So it may be that it uh, could be the due to different methods also the result may be different. But we cannot uh, tell now. Yeah, we have much better computational capacity now. Yeah. Just ten thirty years back, there were not such things. This terabyte of data actually we have to handle. Yeah. So we don't know whether that's right. So, but we maybe a new result. Right. Which has been selected, which has, as you said, maybe the part they have done selected. Not you know over such a long period of time for all these. Uh, so the next symbol, they should be error bars. Yeah, error bars. Yeah.
if the method is uh, right, then it will be great. Uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure that uh, we get point six, point eight for each position. Looking at that, there will be, it will not give me the information that you can get the gamma is going to be In the different phases of the solar cycle, it will change. Yeah, it will. Because depending on how many classes you have, and yeah, in a hot, high latitude, that co that coefficient is not that much high. That will be less, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sorry, Sorry. 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 Which is not anticipated. Then, what physical understanding on physical processes in solar atmosphere will change? Do you think? Yeah, that will. Uh, yeah, current understanding, we know that it should uh, uh, means the rotation rate should decrease. Uh, we are going to upper uh, uh, layers, but uh, yeah, it will give new. The physics we have to do. yeah what physics it will give i i just wanted to know your opinion that what uh what do you think what it will add uh, to the existing um, knowledge of um, whatever you are working on like in context of active region evolution in different part of atmosphere mm -hmm. or that have you thought uh, of any of the problem uh, okay you can think yeah, yeah i will think that i think it's a difficult question uh, I was curious that yeah, I yeah, there is sorry. some uh, online questions. Uh, so who is there in chat box or hand raise? Okay, yeah. Devyandu, you can go and ask or uh, you can read it. Hmm? Can, can you look at high resolution data? It uh, you can. Uh, yeah, we actually that uh, for high resolution data, we have uh, that's why we have uh, used uh, the AI uh, uh, images, AI data at higher layer. But uh, yeah, we got the same result. That, that was the question. Uh, so I yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. You need more data sets. Yeah, more data sets, obviously. Okay, if there is no question, let us thank the speaker. Oh, I had a yeah. quick question. Yeah, yeah. Shall I? Shall I go? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So go. I have a, like. So I think fundamentally your method is uh, can be very easily applied to the photospheric data, the white light data, right? This is the same method that you can apply on white light data. Mm -hmm. Did you? So if you apply the same method in white light data, and if you get the uh, consistent result, because on the photosphere the rotation rate is very well known, well measured. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you can uh, uh, co convince yourself that your result is correct. Yeah, that I will uh, think about. So, I will yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks to speaker. And uh, maybe next uh, next speaker is uh, online. Uh, Jayant Yoshi, properties of uh, ubiquitous uh, magnetic reconnection events in in the lower solar atmosphere. So, uh, can you hear? Yes, yes, I can hear. Yeah, I just so want to the earlier uh, string to be. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. okay, I will do it. Huh? If I... So stop, I will stop it. Huh? Yeah. Now okay. it's okay, yeah, now you can share, please. And yeah. your time is 15 minutes, so it will be better if you keep two minutes for some questions. Huh? Sure, sure. Okay, okay, yeah. please go ahead. Thank you very much for giving me opportunity to present my work. Uh, I'm going to talk about the small scale reconnection event in solar lower atmosphere, and these events are known as a white sun alarm and bomb. I will give a small introduction of what kind of events are this actually. So almost a hundred years back, alarm and when he observed the H alpha spectra, he found that there's a very intense brightening in the wing of the H alpha wing. So for example, you, you can see here in the by the red arrow actually. So those actually he called the hydrogen bomb. Uh, and then if you take the observation from, from the modern day facilities, for example, this is the 
HL5 spectra from the Swedish solar telescope, what you see is uh, uh, the, the gray profiles are in the alarmant bomb and the, this diamond prof profile is the average HL5 profile. So in the alarmant bomb, you see this intense brightening basically in the wing. So this intensity on average get increased in the wings and then go down basically. So these are the characteristic HL5 profile in this alarmant bomb like event. And these are observed in both HL5 and H beta. And if you look at the high resolution uh, HL5 images, for example, you see the image now in the line B and then the, in the uh, flank and then the line four. So one event is highlighted by this uh, red circle. So you see this flame like event. These are the basically alarmant bomb event. So if you go closer to the line four, you still might see the, this event, but you go exactly toward the line four, then these events are not visible. So they are hidden by this fibre structure. So idea is that this suggests that this event basically happened lower in the atmosphere and covered by the chromo chromospheric fibril canopy. So this is our known as a photospheric phenomenon, basically. And why, why they are considered as a magnetic reconnection? So there has been regular observations that this event, for example, observed mostly at the interface of opposite polarity pitches. So for example, there is the observation of this alarmant bomb in H alpha gang and its corresponding high resolution magnetogram. And then you see that it appears at the interface of this polarity inversion. And then there's also been observation of the flux cancellation. But this event usually mostly appears where there is a flux emergence event. So these are the associated with the, mostly with the active regions. For example, um, uh, mode flow around the sunspot or the flux emerging region or the, or the plage sometime or the active region. So there have been also a uh, lot of effort to simulate this event. So there is a simulation from Refrost uh, by Viggo Hastin and what he did it in the simulation box, just uh, give the horizontal flux to emerge to the surface. So what you see here in the sequences of the magnetogram from the simulation is that there's a bipolar region which is appearing on the surface and when it's completely appear on the surface, then you see this much elongated general like structure in the magnetogram. And you also, you see that a lot of areas where this opposite polarity pitches are there actually. And in that event, they synthesized the H alpha observable. So this is the H alpha spectra and they found this event, that enhancement in the wing. And then the image, it looks very similar to what alignment bomb looks like in the observations basically. And then this is the basically vertical cut in the same, vertical cut in the same simulation. So what happening is there, you see in the magnetic field, there's a magnetic null point here. And then if you see the current sheet, so there's a high current density. So basically along this current density, uh, magnetic null point, there is a magnetic reconnection is taking place. So you see that here is the temperature rise during the magnetic reconnection. At the same location, you see the bidirectional jet at that event, basically. So these are as uh, are understood as a event taking in, uh, taking reconnection event taking place in the lower atmosphere in the flux emerging region in the vertically elongated current shift. So, so the, as I said that this event are usually earlier were associated with active region, but in 2016, uh, with the SST data has been observed that they also, this event also appears in the quiet suns. For example, there's an example, the four regions are highlighted, A, B, C, and D. So C and D are uh, regions in the active region, close to the sunspot and the flash spot. A and B are the away from the sunspot. So for example, B and C, if you see, you see this, uh, again, this compact brightening, uh, and which are the active region alarmant bomb, but also in the region A and B, you see this very tiny, small scale brightening. And so this was the first observation of this reconnection like event in the quiet sun as well. So then we started asking question that how abandoned these events are in the quiet sun, that maybe there are more and maybe we need more higher resolution observation to detect all of them. So we couldn't change the telescope. So with the Swedish solar telescope, what we did instead of going into H alpha, we went to H beta. H beta give, because of the shorter wavelengths, 1.3 times much higher resolution. And these are the observation we use. So in the right-hand side, what you see is the H alpha line four. And in the left-hand side, you see is uh, H beta line four. So you see the dynamics, very good observation for one hour. In, and then you see the, all the chromospheric dynamics actually. But there are some differences in the opacity. So thick uh, fibers are much thicker uh, in the H alpha compared to what you see in H beta. So there are little less opacity in H beta uh, line. So we detected 
using the machine learning came in clustering all the events. And what we found that even in the very good frames, the, we found up to 120 quite sun alarmant bomb in the quite sun. So what you see here is the blue beam in the H beta. It is the white band so you granulation and all the red dots actually are the detected alarmant bomb like events. And if we zoom in and I play movie, you see the evolution of this reconnection event everywhere in the field of view. So you see this tiny small events appearing everywhere and very dynamic. So if we extrapolate this to the whole solar surface, so our field of view is 40 by 60 arc second. And if, if we extrapolate this 120 question environment to the whole surface, then there are this extrapolation suggests that there could be about half a million quite an environment bomb in the surface. So again, because of this is these events are too tiny, so tiny, you can't see the details of this event. So I will show you the individual example. So in the top row, what you see is the H alpha, H beta data. So this is the event at the center, the H, the alarm and bomb event. And this is the uh, spectra at the vertical cut here, basically. And here are the, the spectra, evolution of the spectra at that blue cross. And then you see the H beta profile at the time when the alarm and bomb take place. And the, the black one is basically the average profile. The below is the same, but for H beta, you see that enhancement in H, H alpha, basically the second row is the H alpha. So in H alpha, you don't see this clear enhancement, although you see that corresponding brightening in the H alpha image, but not enhancement in the line profile. Uh, and then if you look at the white band data, you see that this event is exactly located in the intergranular lane. And if you look at the magnetogram, you see that it appears again with very small patches of the magnetic field with the opposite polarity. And I would uh, bring your attention that you should note the scale here. So for example, this is uh, uh, 1000 kilometers. So this is 500 kilometers. So this event is very small, 100 kilometer wide and maybe 200 kilometer long. For example, and if I play the movie, you see the dynamic of the event. So it appears for a minute or so and then disappears. And then you see that how the patches are evolving there. So, and then if we measure the flux cancellation among the, the within this red box, you see that the flux is canceled at certain rate. And if we just estimate this with some assumption, the what, how much magnetic energy is dissipated, it is around like 10 power 26 R. So this is in, in our data, this is kind of little bit bigger event, although in, in absolute number, it's really small. But there are also even smaller event actually. So here I'm showing another example where the enhancement in H beta is very big. And in the images also it's very tiny. But when I play the movie, you see that it is very impulsive event. So it appears in the few frames and it's gone. So if you just notice the first frame here, you see that there is a very tiny dot appears for a few seconds and disappears. And also then we analyze that uh, how the brightening appear in the line core with respect to the line beam. So what here you see is this for this particular event, I made a space time plot. So X is time and Y is the slate. And then different color in this space time plot is basically different wavelength position intensity. So if it is red, then it is in the line core. If it is blue, then it is the line beam. So you see that first event appears in the line beam and then in the between line wing and line four in end, it's appearing in line four. So there is an indication that this brightening is appearing, propagating from the lower atmosphere to the upper atmosphere with the, and then if you measure for different events, it could be like three to 10 kilometers per second. So currently I have paper accepted in AND where we did the detailed analysis uh, for all the events. So for example, here we do the uh, detection of event I'm showing. So you see that this is the line wing image here evolution of one particular event. And this is the line four event. So you see that first it's appear in the line V at after certain point it's appear in the line four as well. So we detect, so for example, red pixels are the mark when it first time appears basically in the line four and the blue one it's appear in the line uh, wing basically. And then you also able to measure the, measure the area and the lifetime of this event. So for example, I hear what you see is the, when the event appeared first time in the, basically at this time step in the line B, and this is when it appeared first time in the line four. So you see that there's a displacement between the brightening in the line four and line wing intensity and direction also. So we measure the direction and this direction are usually toward the limb. So if we do the statistical analysis of this event, this displacement of this light wing and line four brightening is, the histogram is shown here. So it is maybe around 100 kilometer displacement, which is the, 
the all the event fall between uh, this is the time basically so time difference when process appear in the line uh, wink and then the line four so the mean difference is around one minute so after it appear in the line wing after one minute it's appear in the line four and the displacement is around 200 kilometers so if you use this two parameter and measure the speed the speed is between zero to ten kilometer per second and this is could be the acoustic speed and also alpine speed in the lower atmosphere and if you measure the orientation so red that uh, dotted uh, dashed line actually is the orientation of the limb so you see that most of the events are basically aligned toward the limb so it suggests that the reconnection is taking place in the vertical uh, current sheet and because of the viewing angle it is projected toward the limb basically so we i just showing the statistics of the different event here so like idea basically so you what we find is that there is a kind of power law so we find the more and more event which are the small the smaller in area uh, and then it's the event which larger area are, are get decreasing almost exponentially and same happened with the lifetime so a mean lifetime is around one minute but uh, there are also event which can go up to like 12 minutes or so or more and also the brightness brightness enhancement so all of this three parameter has a power law and if we make the point um, probability distribution function between among this parameter there is some indication that this and that the events which are brighter or the bigger actually are have a much longer lifetime and the brighter and the event which are the smaller are less uh, doesn't live very long and are less bright so then we did the find out the where actually in the field of the all the event appears so here here is the magnetogram so what you see black and red is the different magnetic polarity so negative and the positive and th this field of view is basically what big patches you see the strong one are the network region and then this is the inter network region and if i plot all the detected event in this field of view so you see the green red and and the uh, yellow are the event detected if it is same appear same time at the same place then it is yellow and it appear more than three times then it is red so most of the event appear only once in a particular pixel in a lifetime but they are all over the field of view so but what we see is that there are this gap so we see that there are this void and this void are between three to five megameter wide and this is the basically the size of the mesogranulation so uh, and that makes sense because it has been found that almost 80 percent of the element which has a certain uh, strength say 30 gauss are basically uh, organizing the mesogranulation uh, lane uh, so it's, 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 it makes sense that the reconnection event might also taking place on that mesogranular boundary so this is just the summary here so we found this uh, event in the lower atmosphere reconnection event and these are so far the smallest magnetic reconnection event observed in the lower atmosphere and there could be around half a million event in the solar lower atmosphere at any given time and also this suggests that these events are taking place in the vertically elongated current sheet and there is a propagation of brightening from the lower atmosphere to the upper atmosphere and then we found that there is a, this void of mesogranulation sign in the distribution of this event thank you okay thank you uh, is there any question from the audience or online no if uh, there is no question can i ask one question yes sure uh, you uh, find the brightening in this uh, h alpha so they are associated with the surges or no no so no. Uh, uh, here actually this uh, because in, this is very quiet sun so quiet sun are usually they are not surges surges are usually associated in the flux emergence region or the active region so the counterpart of the surge one could say is the spicules in the in the quiet sun but we are trying to find out if there is any relation between this event and the spicules uh until now we are not able to get 100 percent confidence that there is any direct relation between this event and the speakers but we are working on it mm -hmm. and about the flux uh, so you observe the flux cancellation yes so everywhere flux cancellation or you no. find sometime so, flux no. or so, emergence so, also so this is quite sun so flux emergence events are very rare very rare. quite sun where there's a very less less activity so most of the, the event you see is very small patches uh, very weak field so for example this event you see here is there are some patches but there are many small patches and the magnetic field is even below than like 20 gauss 
strength actually. So for the big event, we could clear see the flux cancellation event like here, but for the smaller event, we don't. So we need higher resolution observation in the photosphere of, of the magnetograms. But there is a possibility of emergence. Huh? There is a possibility of emergence, but then the question is that how much flux emergence take place in the quiet sun, right? There are the example of the granulation size flux emergence, but because we find the event everywhere in the field of view, is it possible that the flux emergence is taking place everywhere on the sun all the time? That is the question. So, but it is a good question to to pursue actually. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the speaker. Huh? Okay. Now the next talk is by Lokesh Misra, classifying the architecture of a planetary system. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you can stop the series. No, no, I can uh, share so it from this. That's from the zone. Yes, yes, that would be good. Yeah. That's good. So, uh, hi everyone, my name is Lokesh. Thank you for staying so late. There's better things to do outside, I guess. <laughs> and it's always a challenge to give the last talk. Everybody has lost interest and it's tired. So uh, this talk is created to be fun. There are no equations, so that's a fair guarantee you will have some fun here. Um, my name is Lokesh, as I said, I, uh, I almost finished my PhD in Geneva and I did my master's in Germany. So I start here now and I am working on exoplanets. So this was a challenge that this audience is more into sun and the magnetic field. And I was confused the entire time. Uh, I don't fit here in some real sense, but I hope you can enjoy the talk in the sense that this is a much broader scheme that I work on. I work on classifying exoplanetary systems. So the idea is we have uh, in 1995, the first exoplanets were discovered. And since then we have about 4,000, 5,000 exoplanets discovered and they come out to be hosted in different stars. So we have about 1,500 planetary systems. And uh, the task is now to understand what is the difference between these. So I start now, let me find. I'm trying to find the button to go to the next page. Yes, let's go. Okay, we scroll, we do this the bad way. Is there a keyboard here? Yes, yes. Okay. All right, so just a gentle outline. There will be an introduction and then the work that I've done. And then I will, if there is some time, go on further. It's, the <laughs> it's okay, we ju I just continue. So, just to briefly give you an idea what exactly is going on. Since 1995, the first exoplanet was discovered. The people who discovered it got Nobel Prize. They sit next to my office in Geneva. It's really great to be there. And since then, in the last 25 years, people have been working on individual exoplanets. So people try to understand the atmosphere of one planet and compare it to the atmosphere of another planet. And people try to answer the question, how different or unique is the Earth? So that's comparing one planet with another planet. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to do the same kind of studies, but at the planetary system level. So I'm trying to ask the question, how unique or different is the solar system? And that means studying th things about multi-body physics and uh, things like, how can I compare different planetary systems? Now, if you don't have much idea about planetary systems, there's some uh, artistic graphic. So what we are seeing here on the right hand side is an artist impression of the Kepler 90 system compared with the solar system. And on the left is the Trappist one system compared with the solar system. And briefly, just a simple glance on these images tells us that no two planetary systems are same. So the question is what differentiates them. And in that sense, I've been working over the last two and a half for three years on this topic of how can we uh, come up with ideas of classifying planetary systems. There are several ways of doing this. There are about four to five groups in the planet who are working on this problem. Um, one approach that I follow is, I, I follow these two approaches that are on the slide right now, both on the architecture and the state of the system. Right now, I'll be talking about the architecture method. Um, 
So let's go into talking about architecture. What is the architecture of a planetary system? This is again a buzzword that people throw around without much ideas. So I try to define what do I mean by architecture? What I mean by the architecture is you imagine you have a star and you have several planets going around the star. So what is the arrangement and the distribution of these planets and their physical properties? Given this definition, uh, maybe I should also motivate why am I interested in studying uh, architecture. So when I started into this field, the, one of the big problems that people thought was very difficult to solve or very difficult to answer was, how do we take an initial condition and our understanding of physics, and how do we join these two to, uh, to understand what we see in nature today? So taking these initial conditions and the physics that we have, and how do they give rise to the observed properties? And it turns out that the architecture of planetary system is probing this part, and we can use it to test our models and our understanding. Here is an example of what it means to study architecture. So this is an uh, this phenomenon is called peas in a pod in our field. Uh, what is happening is here is that you have a star with multiple planets, and people found out that these different planets they often tend to have the same size, same mass. If you have three or more planets, the spacing between two planets is also similar. So that's what is shown on the graph on the left. On the x-axis is this radius of one planet, uh, which is on the inside towards the star. And on the y-axis is the radius of the adjacent outer planet. And when we plot these, the sizes of these two planets, we see that most of them are clustered around this y equals to x line, giving us the impression that the sizes of most of these uh, adjacent neighboring planets is similar. And then we try to re reproduce the same work with our simulations, and that's on the right hand side. This work was published last year, and we are able to do a good job in matching observations with theory and have a good idea of what is going on. The only problem is that this uh, framework is limited. So this is what we call in our field a population level study, what, which, by which I mean that you take the data from uh, you take planets from one star and then planets from some other star and then planets from some other star and you create a catalog of many planets and that's the population so you can answer questions like is there a trend or not but you cannot answer the question is this system showing this trend or is that system showing this trend so for example if you're interested in asking is the solar system an example of a peas in a prod property then this original old framework cannot do that and uh, there was a reliance on correlation coefficients which are not really useful for doing physics so I was thinking of trying to come up with a way of uh, coming up with a framework to allow a system level study, which allows us to quantify these kinds of architecture. And uh, oh, this is touch screen. Cool. Sorry. And this allows us to compare different systems, the architecture at the system level. So here's a simple schematic diagram of how does this work. Um, on this cartoon sketch, on the x-axis will be the distance from the star. On the y-axis, this will be the property of a planet that you're interested in. You're interested in masses or radiuses or the amount of water on the planet or the amount of uh, core mass in the planet. You can think of any property and you put on the y-axis and then you try to put all kinds of variation. So maybe there are some systems where these blue dots are now planets and on the because of the y-axis, they denote the mass of the planet. And what this shows is that the masses of the planets in this system, they are not very different. They are very similar to each other. So I call this architecture the similar kind architecture. It is also possible that there are systems in which the property is increasing with distance or decreasing with distance. These are called ordered or anti-ordered architectures. And there's also the possibility that nature is just doing some weird stuff. And this is a mixed type architecture. So a fun question to you, you all know the solar system very well, what kind of architecture the solar system could be? And I would come back to that in a few moments. So um, that was the conceptual idea of how to classify the architecture. And of course, there's a mathematics behind all of this. I'm not just making stuff up in thin air, but we don't go into the mathematics right now. I use two coefficients and I study them. The way the framework works is that you take a quantity like the mass of a planet, the radius of a planet, the eccentricity, the density, any kind of stuff that you're interested in, you put it into this framework and it gives you two numbers, the coefficient of similarity and the coefficient of variation. And these two numbers then tell you how are these properties arranged and distributed in your system. And this way you have a quantified architect notion of architecture for your planetary system. Um, if you put coefficient of similarity versus coefficient of uh, variation on a, on a diagram, this gives you what I call the architecture space. And it has extremely interesting mathematical properties. For example, a two planet system can only be in this green shaded region where it's written n equals two. A three planet system can only be in the three 
uh, the shaded region which is written n equals three. And interestingly, there is a forbidden region between the two. It reminds me of quantum mechanics where you have forbidden gaps where things cannot go in. I don't know if this correlation is coming out of physics or what. I've not assessed that. Um, if I take the same phase space and I put, uh, I fill it with data points. So um, on the left, I'm put using some simulations from the burn model, which I cannot describe right now. And the idea is that the blue points are theory and the orange points are observations. And we see that they don't match. And that's OK, because when we make an observation of a planetary system, we are not really getting the full picture. There are detection biases involved. When I take the blue points, that's the theoretical point from the left hand side. And I try to apply the same biases from the measurements. I get the points on the right hand side. And this matches very well with the orange contour, which shows the observation. So we basically understand what we are seeing. There's not a big puzzle over here. But the question is, does this concept that I'm proposing, does it really work? I would have GIFs over here if I was doing my own presentation, but that's OK. I guess you get the idea. So uh, to give you an idea of whether this system, this framework, this concept works or not, um, here there's a thing called the burn model. It's a very complicated model for simulating planetary systems and making them in your computer. And you, we use that in burn to run simulations and make thousands of planetary systems. And I have picked randomly selected some planetary systems based on my coefficients. And on the bottom row, what we are seeing are planetary systems where the inner planets are very massive. That's what we see by the big circles. And the outer planets are very small. These systems have what I call the anti-ordered architecture. If I go down here, the on the top panel, now you see something which looks like ordered, where the small guys are on the inside and the big guys are on the outside. In the middle panel now, we are seeing mixed kind of architecture where there is no clear trend between how the mass of a planet or other properties are varying. And in the third panel, which would have been nice on a, okay, this is this similar kind of architecture where the planetary mass remains the same for all planets in the system. So some comments about what we are seeing, the coefficients that I propose are able to quantify the architecture. Um, similar values of the coefficients actually denote similar kind of architecture and vice versa. So you can start doing the game of comparing the architecture. And the interesting thing is that all of these simulated planetary systems, they start from different initial conditions and have different kinds of physics that go into them. But at the end, the architecture comes out to be similar, even though we don't know why. I mean, now we know why because of this work. So on this space, the classification is possible because we see that there is emerging properties. And of course, the question was, uh, does this framework also work for nature? So I sat down for two months and created a catalog of observed multiplanetary systems. This is shown on this diagram on the left over here. And uh, I highlighted some of the famous planetary systems. Here is uh, the solar system. And the solar system's architecture is ordered. Uh, it has small rocky guys on the inside, inside and very massive giant gassy planets on the outside. So it captures, the framework automatically captures the historic knowledge we have that the solar system is ordered. If you know about the famous planetary system, Trappist-1, which is on the bottom here, it's a very famous planetary system, three planets in the habitable zone. Uh, it's a similar kind of architecture and so on. So we, we see that the framework also works on nature. Um, another, I now start to do, why do we do this? Like, why do, you, do I take the effort and the pain of going around and measuring the architecture and comparing one, the architecture of one planetary system to another? What is the reason behind all of this work? The reason is, uh, initially, we did not know that it was possible to take the initial conditions, that is the disk physics and the star physics, how the star is born, and add in our knowledge of how planet formation works and whatever planetary system comes out, we did not know if there is a link possible. And now with this framework uh, in place, a, 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 frame, a map like this is possible and that's something that's come out from this work. So what I'm showing here is that if you start with a disk with gas mass, which is low, and it, has, uh, it does not matter what kind of metallicities you take for the... So this division of the blue box and the red box is completely dominated by initial conditions. 
If, on the other hand, I had a volume like button where I can crank the button and increase the dynamics which are occurring in the planetary system. And by dynamics, I mean multi-body effects, planets uh, interacting with other planets, planets interacting with the protoplanetary disk. If I continue to increase the architecture changes from similar to mixed type, then from mixed to anti-ordered and from anti-ordered to ordered. Uh, this work gives a lot of testable correlations. For example, um, we saw here that we see that it doesn't matter what kind of metallicities, sorry, that was touch screen that I did not know. So it doesn't matter what kind of metallicity you put in, you can get similar kind of architecture as long as the disk mass remains low and so on. And when I try to test these kinds of correlation from observations, we get a good match with what we see in our theoretical data. Overall, the image I have in yeah, I'm, I'm summarizing. So the, the aim that I see on how this work could map out in the, into the future is that we have a lot of large surveys on protoplanetary disks going on. The ALMA survey is one of the famous ones. Um, and we can use these disk surveys to get the initial conditions. And we can use a new standard model that may appear in the next decade or so. And we try to uh, calculate what kind of occurrences or frequency of architecture do we see in the galaxy. And this could be a good test for my framework, as well as the planet formation uh, models that we have around right now. In addition, this framework gives a lot of new questions, like what is the occurrence rate of architecture types and can habitability be a function of uh, architecture? So in short, I, I summarize right now that I work on architecture physics and I propose a new framework for classifying the architecture. There are links with internal composition, which I did not go into right now, and there's some links with formation pathways. If you have anything else to ask, please speak free. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any question from uh, audience or online? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. No, Hi, okay. uh, fantastic talk. Uh, so uh, I wanted to know, um, so I saw, depending on metallicity, you, you can have from a similar um, mass disk, uh, a mixed or a similar system, or uh, uh, from a high mass disk, you can have two different uh, systems. So uh, it's, it's a, so basically, it, you know, so the, micro, so the big debate about is in a problem. Uh, is whether migration destroys all the memory. Uh, so uh, th does migration then depends on the metallicity of the disk? Uh, indirectly, yes, uh, because if you have high metallicity, you will have uh, planets, it will give rise to planets which are larger in mass. And when you have planets which are larger in mass, they can interact with the disk more efficiently. And when you have large mass planets and you have a disk present, then migration is occurring much more strongly. So yes, there is an indirect link between metallicity and uh, migration, but we don't discuss that. Like it's very, very indirect, like third, fourth order effects. Yeah. And uh, regarding what you commented on, whether peas in a pod can be destroyed by migration, we think that peas in a pod is kind of assisted by migration. It would be difficult to establish some effects within the peas in a pod phenomena without migration. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, if uh, there is no question, let us thanks to speaker. And thanks to all the speakers of this session. Uh...